This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. Welcome to today's program. My name is Rick Renner, and I'm really so glad that you've joined me, and thank you for letting me come right into your space. Today, I'm continuing my brand new series, which is called Speaking in Tongues. What is it, and is it really for everyone? You know, when I was growing up, I was raised in a denomination that didn't believe in speaking in tongues, and we thought that people who were speaking in tongues were crazy. We really thought that. But my friends, speaking in tongues is real, and we need to know what it is, and is it really for everyone? And today, we're going to be going to the book of Acts, and I'm going to show you the pattern in the New Testament for people being saved and then being subsequently filled with the Holy Spirit. This is going to answer so many questions for you, but please order the entire series called Speaking in Tongues. What is it, and is it really for everyone? And of course, it comes with a study guide. I want you to have teaching you can trust. I don't want you just to hear it or see it. I want you to really be able to re read the material, see that it really is in the Bible, and get it down deep inside you. And by the way, if you know anybody that's asking questions about the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, this would be a great answer for them and a good gift for you to give them. And we're also offering you my book, which is called The Holy Spirit and You Working Together as Heaven's Dynamic Duo. The back of the book says, the key to experiencing more of God. When you really partner with the Holy Spirit and learn how to relate to Him as a person, He begins to release His power through your life and you and the Holy Spirit become the dynamic duo. And that's what this book is about. And we're offering you my book, which is called Why We Need the Gifts of the Holy Spirit. It seems to me almost a silly question. But today, people are questioning, why do we need them? Do we really need to make room for the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the church? Why do we need the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Well, we need them or God would not have given them. What are they? How do they operate? How do you activate them in your church? All of that is in this book and you will devour it. And we're also offering you my new book that I want you to have, which is called Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters, and the World Before the Flood. Look at that book cover. But my friends, what's in this book is truly amazing. And the endorsements are just remarkable. They've been coming in from Christian leader after Christian leader. And they're all saying, wow, this is like going to a movie. It is so riveting. One person said, I couldn't put it down. This answered so many questions for me about events that were occurring before the flood and what we're now seeing in society again. But my friends, this is really an end time book and I want you to have it. And you can order this and you can order all these things by going to our website or you can just give us a call to order them. And we're waiting to know how to pray for you. When you reach out to us by calling that number on the screen or sending an email to that email address, we will really pray for you. Yes, you can pray by yourself. Of course you can. You're a child of God. You have access to God by yourself. But Jesus did say that where two or three of you would gather together and agree there is special power. And we would love to agree with you. And when we get into agreement, Jesus promises he'll move and he'll respond. So let us know how to pray for you and Jesus will do something wonderful for you. But today we're going to be talking about the second work of grace, which is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see the pattern in the New Testament of people being saved. That's the first work of grace and subsequently being filled with the Holy Spirit, which I call the second work of grace. This is going to be good. I'll be back in just a moment. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Today, I'm going to show you from Scripture the first work of grace is always followed by the second work of grace, which is the baptism in the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. And how I wish someone had shared this teaching with me earlier in life. This is going to be good. But first, I want to share three testimonies with you. One man called to share something really cool. He's working with an organization that started a recovery program for guys going through drug rehabilitation. He introduced the men to Rick on YouTube. And when Rick comes on, they take the remote and hide it so all the men in the group will watch Rick. 
He said they're usually quite rowdy, but when Rick comes on, they're quiet and they open their Bibles and they take notes. He said he has never seen this effect on the guys before and he wanted Rick to know. Well, I want to say thank you for letting me know. We actually have an extensive ministry to people that are recovering from drugs and I'm very happy to hear this testimony. But here is another testimony. Dear friends, thank you so much for your response, prayers, and encouragement, and spiritual support. One night I wrote and requested prayer for my husband, who couldn't sleep. After you all contacted me and we prayed again, he slept well for many hours and got up in the morning with much more strength as well as a fresh mind. Thank you so much for praying for me. Well, you know what? If you can't sleep, that's a big deal. My friends, when people can't sleep, they get tired. They're frustrated, and if you need sleep, call us. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 4, verse 8, that he gives us sleep, sweet sleep, and we'll pray with you for you to have good sleep. But here's one more testimony. We've been praying with one woman for several months for healing. She called today and is very excited to say that the pain and the ulcer in her colon and the colitis are gone. Her doctor said those things don't just go away and that this is a miracle. Well, we believe in miracles. Thank you for letting us know that God answered prayer. Amen. And if you have a prayer request, let us know how to pray for you too. But reach for your Bible. And today we're going to go to the New Testament and we're going to see the pattern in the book of Acts of people being saved and then subsequently being filled with the Holy Spirit. But let's go back to John chapter 20, verses 21 and 22, where we find the moment when the apostles were actually born again. And in John 20, 21 and 22, Jesus came to them and said, peace be unto you. Notice that word, peace. Peace is the fruit of salvation. When you get saved, you have peace with God. And Jesus said, peace be unto you. As my father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. And we saw in the previous program that when he breathed on them, the Greek actually says he breathed into them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost, receive ye the Greek word labete, which means take it right now, receive it in this very moment. And in that very moment, the Holy Spirit entered into the hearts of the disciples and they were born again. And these were the first individuals to ever be born again in history, and immediately coming with the born-again experience was peace, and that's why Jesus said, peace be unto you. Peace is the fruit of salvation. Now, when I was growing up in our church, we preached salvation, and we preached peace with God, and when people got saved, they had peace with God, but we didn't have a lot of power in our lives. I say that we were very peaceful powerless people. We did not understand that there was another subsequent second work of grace, which is called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And the fruit of the baptism in the Holy Spirit is power. The fruit of salvation is peace. But you got to have the second work if you want to have power. And that is why Jesus said to the disciples in Luke 24, verse 49, after they're already born again, he said to them, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry you in the city of Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. Wait, 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 wait. They were already saved. Yes, they were. They had peace. But after they were saved, Jesus said, we're not done yet. There's something else you need to receive, the promise of the Father, which will come upon you. It will endue you with power from on high. And that word power is the Greek word dunamis. The word, word, the word dunamis describes explosive, superhuman power, enormous energy that produces phenomenal, extraordinary, and unparalleled results. It is the very word used to describe the full might of an advancing army. And the word power here, the Greek word dunamis, was the word used by the Greeks and the Romans to describe a force of nature like an earthquake or a hurricane or a tornado. Jesus was describing amazing, divine, supernatural power that would turn you into a force of nature. Now, when they got saved in the upper room, they had peace, but they didn't have power. And so Jesus said, don't go anywhere until you receive the second work of grace. And when it comes, you're going to receive divine power. Then when you come to Acts chapter 1, verse 4, the Bible says, 
and being assembled together with them, Jesus commanded them. Notice this was not a suggestion. This was a command. He commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. And again, they were already saved. That happened in John chapter 20, but now he commanded them, you don't leave Jerusalem until you receive the promise of the Father. And then in verse 5, Jesus described what that is. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. This obviously was a subsequent experience different from salvation. And then we find in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, when they received this subsequent second work of grace. And the Bible says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And this is the first time in the book of Acts the people are baptized in the Holy Ghost and speak with tongues. Now I'm going to give you five examples. The first is here in Acts chapter 2, and this begins the New Testament pattern of being first saved, that's the first work of grace, and subsequently receiving a second work of grace, which is the baptism in the Holy Spirit and speaking with other tongues. The pattern was repeated in Samaria. And when you come to Acts chapter 8, you find that Philip went down to Samaria and began to preach Christ to the people. And wow, the power of God erupted. Many that were lame began to walk. Demons were cast out. Those that were sick were healed. And we read about this in Acts chapter 8, verse 12, where the Bible says, They believed Philip preaching the things concerning the King of God and the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, and they were baptized, both men and women. All right, stop. I need to ask a question. Do you baptize non-saved people? No. The very fact that they are baptized means they repented. The Holy Spirit came into them. They were born again, which means they have received the first work of grace. They were sealed with the Holy Spirit, and that is why they were baptized. If they weren't saved, if they weren't born again, He would not have water baptized them. But when you come to chapter 8, verse 14 and 15, the Bible continues to say, Now when the apostles were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they came down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Now there's a little confusion about this phrase, that they might receive the Holy Ghost. It's really talking about the subsequent experience of being baptized in the Holy Ghost. They already had the Holy Ghost. They were saved. You don't baptize people that are not saved, and you cannot be saved if you don't have the Holy Spirit. That is why we read in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. For you to be saved and to be water baptized, you have to already be born again. You have to already receive the Holy Spirit inside. But now the disciples are coming for them to have a subsequent work, praying that the Holy Spirit would come upon them, which is different than what happened in their salvation. And they laid their hands on them, and the Bible says they received the Holy Ghost. Now, somebody might say, yeah, but when you read this example in Acts chapter 8, it doesn't say they spoke in tongues. Well, at a first reading, it appears that it doesn't say that, but a deeper reading shows that they did. For example, in Acts chapter 8, verse 2, we find there was a sorcerer who saw something supernatural happen when the people were filled with the Holy Spirit and actually offered money that he could lay hands on people and see the same results. Well, what was he seeing? The answer is in Acts chapter 8, where the Bible says, thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. Wow, the word matter is the Greek word logos, and the word logos is the word for words or speaking, and you could literally translate it, you have neither part nor lot in this kind of speaking. Simon the sorcerer's desire was impure, and now Peter says, you don't have anything to do with this kind of speaking. So apparently some kind of a speaking took place when people were baptized in the Holy Ghost, of course. And here we see in Samaria, the first work of grace, they were saved, they were water baptized. 
Then the apostles came down from Jerusalem, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost or be filled with the Holy Spirit, a second work of grace, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in tongues, and that is what Simon the sorcerer saw. But then we see the pattern is repeated again in the life of Saul or the apostle Paul. And when you come to Acts chapter 8, verse 4, he's traveling on the road to Damascus to persecute believers. He has a vision. He looks up, he sees Christ, and he hears Jesus say, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And in the next verse, he says, who art thou, Lord? That's what Saul says. Who art thou, Lord? And Jesus said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. But notice he called Jesus Lord. That was the moment that he got saved. We're told in Romans chapter 10, if any man will call Jesus Lord, he shall be saved. And in that moment, Saul, who later became the apostle Paul, in that moment, he received the first work of grace. The spirit of God entered into his heart and laying on the road to Damascus, he was born again. The three days later, he had a subsequent experience when a disciple named Ananias showed up. And Ananias laid hands on him, and we read about this in Acts chapter 9, verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him said, Saul, even the Lord Jesus that appeared to thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit, which was a subsequent experience, a second work of grace. This was different than what happened to him on the road to Damascus. On the road to Damascus, he got saved. The Holy Spirit came and he was born again. But now when Ananias came, this was a different experience, a subsequent work of grace. And we know that he spoke in tongues, even though it's not recorded in Acts chapter 9. And the reason we know that is because Paul wrote about it himself in 1 Corinthians 14, 18, when Paul himself said, I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than ye all, which is Paul's own testimony that when he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he also spoke in tongues. Then we see this pattern is repeated again in the household of Cornelius, and that's in Acts chapter 10, verse 44 and 45. When Peter is preaching the gospel to a Gentile crowd, they believe, and at one moment they get saved and they also get baptized in the Holy Spirit, which means sometimes these two works of grace can occur in one moment. And we find it in Acts 10, 44, as he yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them when they heard the word, Verse 46, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. They were saved and they received the second work of grace all in one ball of wax. It can happen to you all at once as well. Usually it's two separate experiences, but here we find that it can occur in one event. And then when you come to Acts chapter 19, the fifth example. And by the way, Acts chapter 19 is 23 years after the day of Pentecost. That's a long time. And when you come to Acts chapter 19, you find that Paul came into the city of Ephesus and he found certain disciples. They were disciples of John the Baptist. They had been baptized by John the Baptist, but they didn't know that Jesus came. And Paul preached the gospel to them, told them that Jesus the Messiah came, and he rebaptized them in water after they repented and after they were saved and they had expressed their faith in Christ. And once he baptized them in water, he didn't stop. Acts 19 verse 6 says, And Paul laid his hands on them and the Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues and they prophesied. Well, they were already saved. He baptized them in water. He could have just said, see you guys later. But Paul knew the work was not done. They needed the second work of grace, which is a subsequent experience. So in Acts chapter 2, we find people are saved. Then subsequently, they are filled with the Holy Spirit. My friends, this is so important. Acts chapter 8, we find the Samaritans. They received the gospel. They were saved. They were water baptized. That's the first work of grace. Then later they received the second work of grace, which is the infilling of the Holy Spirit. The apostle Paul was saved. The first work of grace on the road to Damascus. He was born again. But three days later, he received a subsequent experience of being baptized in the Holy Ghost. That's the second work of grace. Then you go to the household of Cornelius. They hear the gospel. They are saved and bam, the Holy Spirit also comes upon them. They receive both in one moment. Then you come to Acts chapter 19. 
Paul preaches the gospel to this group of disciples. They get saved. He water baptizes them. That's the first work of grace. But he didn't leave them until they received the second work of grace. He laid his hands on them. They were baptized in the Holy Ghost. They began to speak in tongues. But in all of these examples, we find there are two works of grace which are essential and fundamental to every believer's life. This is for everyone. And in every single case, they are saved. Then they are baptized with the Holy Ghost. And when they're baptized with the Holy Ghost, they also speak with other tongues. But why tongues? What are tongues all about? That's what we're going to see in the next program. But if you've never received the second work of grace, which is being baptized in the Holy Spirit, you call us and we'll pray with you because there's a subsequent work of God waiting for you right now. But I'll be back in just a moment. Someone has asked the question, why do people fall? in God's presence. Well, the first time that I saw that, I was quite shocked because I had never seen that in my church where I was growing up. But there in front of me was a prayer line and someone was laying hands on the sick and the people began to fall under the ground. It literally looked like they were collapsing under the weight of something. And that's exactly what was happening. The supernatural power of God heavenly came upon them and something had to give and their feet let out from under them. They collapsed onto the floor. And in fact, this happened to me in 1975 when I was a young man. I was prayed for, collapsed on the floor, felt the power of God radiating from my head to my feet and back and forth. And when I stood up, I was miraculously healed. That is why some people collapse in the presence of God. The power of God comes upon them and something's got to give and it's not God, it's the person who collapses. If you do not speak in tongues, or if you do speak in tongues, this series, Speaking in Tongues, What Is It and Is It Really for Everyone, will be an eye-opener and a game-changer in your life. Many people are confused about tongues. So Rick, who was also once confused about this subject, takes you into the scriptures to see what the Bible says about speaking in tongues, the purpose of tongues, are tongues really for every believer, the value of speaking in tongues, and so much more. You'll forever thank God for the clarity you receive in this important five-part series. And it's available in digital or physical format starting at just $11. In addition, we are also offering the books The Holy Spirit and You for $17 and Why We Need the Gifts of the Holy Spirit for $12. Both of these books have become favorite resources for Christians whose hearts are hungry for more of the Spirit of God. In each of these books, Rick gives you deep teaching and practical help to walk into the powerful relationship with the Holy Spirit that your heart longs to experience. Don't wait. Order your copies to Today, bundle the five-part series, Speaking in Tongues. What is it and is it really for everyone? And the books, The Holy Spirit and You, and Why We Need the Gifts of the Holy Spirit. And for a limited time, we are also offering Rick's book, Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters, and the World Before the Flood, for a special pre-sale discounted price. Call the number on your screen now or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey, this is Rick Renner, and I'm standing in one of the long corridors in the Tulsa headquarters building. And these corridors are lined with photography of our past ministry. For example, here, it's amazing. You see a picture of me and Denise first starting our ministry as we're traveling in the car with Paul and Philip on her lap, and there's little Joel. But then you look over here, and you see our Russian ministry. Here's Golden Stars with some of the Russian movie stars who came to help us at that event. We had more than 16,000 senior citizens show up. That is amazing. Then you see the youth ministry and us working with members of the government. And here you see again, me and Denise in our first little church we started in Arkansas many, many, many years ago. And then you look over here and you see us filming TV programs. I mean, there's just so much. And when you walk through these hallways and look at all these pictures, you're just surrounded with what God has done throughout our ministry and it is amazing. And now, every day in this facility, ministry is taking place. Oh, I wish you could hear the phone calls. And when our team begins to pray, it is like a roar of prayer that you can hear when you walk through our partner care ministry or the letters that are going out or the resources and resources are books and 
USBs and all kinds of video and audio, and it's going to the ends of the earth. And we're able to do all of that because we have a facility where we can do it. And paying off this facility is our current goal. You know, when we started the Ministry Expansion Project, it was quite large, but we've already paid off half of it. That's amazing. And you helped us to do that. And I want to say thank you. Please help us continue until we finish it. And if you're not a part of the team yet, please pray about becoming a part of our Ministry Expansion Project giving team so we can pay off all of this and then liberate all that money to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And that's our desire. So I want to say thank you in advance for helping us. Today I have shown you from the book of Acts the pattern of being saved and then subsequently being filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking with other tongues. My friends, there are five examples of this in the book of Acts. It is irrefutable. And God has salvation for you. And God also secondly has the baptism in the Holy Spirit for you. But I want you to have the entire series because it is such an eye-opener. And the name of the series is Speaking in Tongues, What Is It? And Is It Really for Everyone? And it comes with a study guide. You need to hear this series. You need to share this series with someone else. And we're offering you my book, which is called The Holy Spirit and You Working Together as Heaven's Dynamic Duo, and my book, Why We Need the Gifts of the Holy Spirit. These two books are marvelous. And we're offering you my brand new book, which is called Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters, and the World Before the Flood. But I want to pray for you right now. Put your hand on your heart. Father, I thank you that you have many works of grace for us, salvation. You've got the baptism and the Holy Spirit for us. And I pray, Father, for my friend listening to me today that has never received the baptism and the Holy Spirit, open your heart and say, Jesus, fill me right now. And Jesus, I ask you to baptize them with the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you want somebody to pray with you specifically about this, you call the number on the screen because we're waiting to pray for you right now. But we'll be back tomorrow. And tomorrow we're going to really dive into the subject, what is speaking in tongues? What is the purpose of it? It's going to be good. I'll see you then. If you've never received Jesus as your Savior and Lord, now is the time for you to experience a new life Jesus has to give you. Pray this prayer with me right now. Lord, I repent of my sin and receive you as my Savior and Lord. Wash away my sin and make me completely new. I thank you that my sin is removed and Satan no longer has any right to lay claim on me. I faithfully promise that I will serve you as my Lord for the rest of my life. Amen. If you just prayed the prayer of salvation with us, would you please let us know by going to renner.org forward slash salvation? We would love to connect with you. This program was made possible by the giving of the God-called partners of Renner Ministries.